Moving along to task number two, which is authentication cause and hello interval. The first thing is to enable OSPFE3 encryption and authentication between R1 and R2 using uh, MD5 for authentication and AES128 for encryptions. Okay, so as you might aware that IPv6 has a built-in IPsec capability or extension header for ESP and AH into the protocol. So that capability is being leveraged here with the OSPF authentication. So under serial interface, you can do IPv6, OSPF, you do question mark, you have an option of authentication only, or you do encryption, which is also include authentication. Here we're gonna do both encryption and authentication. So we'll choose encryption. And here we just, this is where we specify IPsec with SPI or security parameter index. And this is just a value and just need to be matched on both sides. We're just gonna pick a value of 500. And then ESP for encryption. We're gonna pick the type of encryption. We say it's gonna be AES with key length of 128. And here we have to specify the a 32 character key. So it can be pretty much everything as long as it's matched on both sides. So we can make it easy to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's pretty much 10 character. So let me copy paste, copy paste. That should be 30, zero one, that's 32. Okay, question mark. Now we have a type of authentication. We can do either MD5 or SHA1. I believe we asked to do MD5. And we also need to specify another key for 32 characters in length. So we can pretty much copy and paste just for our testing purposes here. And enter. Okay, so give it a couple seconds. The neighbor should go down because now the other side wouldn't understand now that the OSPF messages are encrypted. You can see right here it's complaining about the packet being received is not encrypted. On the R1, since we have encryption enabled already, this is very similar to the IPsec. If you're familiar with the IPsec lantern -lant tunnel, when it receives the unencrypted packet, when it's expected to be encrypted. So if you do show run interface uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, here's our command. And looks like we've got some lock messages right here on R2. And you can see the dead time has expired since they no longer communicate to one another as R2 does not have authentication or encryption enabled. Now to bring the neighbor, Adjacency backup, we're going to copy what we have on the R1 side and paste it on R2 and enter. Give it a couple seconds. You can see the adjacency come back up. If we do show IPv6 route, OSPF, it should again learn all the routes now that the adjacency is back up. All right, so we just enable encryption authentication. Now let's move on to uh, the second line items, which is on R1, zero interface, manually configure the cost to be 10. So on R1, you show IPv6 route or SPF, and here's the route that's being received from R2 over the zero interface. Currently the cost is 651. So to change the cost of that, we get under the zero interface where the route will be received with uh, IPv6 OSPF. Here we have the cost command, and then we said we want it to be 10. And do another show IPv6 route OSPF. You can see right here, the route has changed from 651 to 10. Okay, so that is mission accomplished. Next, we want to adjust the hello interval between R1 and R2 to five seconds instead of 10, which is the default. So, on the R1 side, serial 000, IPv6 OSPF command is, you can find hello interval, 10 second, enter. Actually, that should be five here. Try that again. Okay, it looks like we have a lock message on R2. You can see the adjacency went down on the R2, between R2 and R1, because the dead time expired, and this is because the in OSPF, the neighbor doesn't like if they have the hello interval mismatch, so we need to have that both uh, set identically on both sides. Now that we just changed the hello interval to five on R1, we also need to hop onto R2 and change that to match as well. Right here, so hello interval five. And now if you do show IPv6, OSPF interface, you can see the adjacency came back up. 
now that we have matching hello interval and we do the look at the interface you can see right here the hello has been changed to five and the dead time has been automatically adjusted to be the full time of the hello interval which has now become 20 instead of 40 which is the default so the next item is to change the OSPF priority on R1 fast 00 to ensure that R1 is always a designated router. So what we have right now, if you look at R1, and we've looked at this a little bit earlier as far as the role between R1 and R3. So looking at fast 00 on R1, you can see that currently a designated router is R3, and R1 is currently a backup designated router for VLAN 1, 2, 3. Okay, and for R3, if you show IPv6 OSPF interface fast 00, you'll see that itself is a, has a state of designated router. So now we're going to increase, since they both have the default priority of 1, to make sure that R1 is always a DR router, or designated router, we're going to increase the priority on the fast 00 interface with the IPv6 OSPF and right here priority command to the maximum of 255 and then enter and this process is not preemptive so even though that right now r1 has a higher priority you can see right here priority has been changed to 255 its state is maintained or stays to be a bdr because the action is not preemptive so what we need to do is to clear ipv6 OSPF process to force the renegotiation or re-elections re of the DR. Choose yes. And then do another show command on that. And you might need to even make sure they clear it on both sides. But here, let's do another show IPv6 OSPF interface. So you can see right here, the R1 has changed state to designated router with itself being designated router and router R3 being a backup designated router. Same thing if you do a up arrows and take a look. R3 is currently in the state of BDR with priority 1 and R1 is a designated router. And if you want R3 not to be either the designated router or backup designated router, we would have changed the priority to 0. That way we would never be elected to neither one of those roles. But since we only have two routers here, it's a, a good idea to always have a backup designated router. That should be it for task number two. Okay, next up is task number three with default route advertisement. First on R2, we're going to conditionally advertise the default route with a default matrix type. And then we're going to unconditionally advertise the default route with the default matrix type. So start off with that. Conditionally being that R2 requires a an existence of a default route in this routing table before I will advertise that into the OSPF. So let's uh, show you that with start up with IPv6 under router OSPF1 process. The command is default information originate. And here we have an option of always, which, which we will try next. But for conditionally advertising default route, that's all we need. So go ahead and enter that. Now, on R1, we just show IPv6 route OSPF. You will see that currently there's no default route on R1, and that's because even on R2, if you do show IPv6 routes, R2 currently does not have the default route either. That's why it hasn't really advertised the default route. So what we're going to do next is to create a static route pointing to null interface just to force to have the default route in the R2 routing table. And now if we go over to R1, and you can see R1 is now learning the default route from R2, and the route is being OE2, which is the external type 2, right here, OSPF. Okay, so you can either use the static default route pointing out just like what we have here, or usually it will be learned through whether it's a different routing protocols or a valid static route pointing to some other next hop. Okay, but just for our demonstration purposes, that seems to do the trick to have the default route advertise. Now we're going to look at unconditionally advertise a default route. I mean, obviously you can achieve that doing this as well. But what we're going to try next is actually, let me make sure that default route has been removed first, which it has. Then under the IPv6 router, again, getting back under the routing process. 
we'll do a default route information originate and this time we use the word always so regardless of whether or not r2s a default route in its routing table it will advertise the default route which is right here okay one thing to note is the by default is external type 2 and this is kind of get into our next task which is change the default route to metrics type 1 and note the differences on R3 and make sure that R3 can reach R2 loopbacks. Okay, so you can see by default, the external route is type two. And even if you move to R3, and also one thing to note is the metric is one. If we do show IPv6 route OSPF, you can see the routes remain external type two and the metrics never change. So the metrics, stays the same all the way from where it was introduced to the network which is r2 all the way to pretty much anywhere in the network with the external type 2. so now we're going to change that to type 1 and see the difference so i'm going to up arrow with the exact same command and now we're going to force the matrix type to be type 1. okay now with r1 up arrow you can see now instead of oe2 it's become oe1 and instead of matrix 1, it's become 11. And this is because the default, when it was introduced to the network's matrix 1, it's added by 10, which is the serial interface matrix that we configured earlier. And if you hop onto R3 and do a show command, you can see it's become 21. So in the sense, the matrix has become cumulative along the way when it's the route is external type 1. Now to verify the reachability from R3, you can ping 2001 to 002, which is RT loopback one. That's loopback two, and that's loopback three. See, all those are pingable because the packets are following default route to get to R2. Okay, so that's task number three. Now, for task number four, route filter, it says that we want to prevent R3 from installing a route to R2 loopback zero. So, currently on R3, R3 is still seeing a route, which is 2012, that belongs to R2 loopback 0. We want to prevent that from being installed or used by R3, but R3 should still be able to reach R2 loopback 0, and that's through the mean of default route. So, what we need to do is to configure a route filter inbound on R3. Right here, just to again refresh our memory with the diagram here. So, anything that's being learned from R1, including R2 loopback 0 interfaced by R3, we're going to filter that. So, R3 using IP v6 prefix list and we're going to call it from area one deny and r2 and just copy this so there's no typo and then we're going to have to permit everything else because that's the only thing we want to deny that's an equal 128. now under ipv6 router or spf the command to filter as you can guess is again distribute list The only option we have is the prefix list, which we call from area one. And the direction is inbound or in to the interface path zero zero. Enter. Then we do show IPv6 prefix list detail. You can see we got a hit count already for the R2 loopback zero, which means if we do show IPv6 router or SPF, we should no longer see 2012, which we don't. Okay, but we should still be able to ping 2012, and that's through the default routes. And if you do show IPv6 OSPF database and look through this, since we're dealing with a area one, which is non-backbone, so we're looking at the inter-area routes. So you can see right here, although the RT loopback of 2012 has been removed from the routing table, which actually still exists in its uh, OSPF database. Okay, so the filter that we just put in is basically preventing the route from being installed into the routing table, it, it, but it doesn't really stop R3 from learning that particular route. Okay, so that is, that's it for task number four. Now for the next task number five, which is the area summarization or route summarization, we want to configure the smaller summary routes on R1 to include R3 loopback 1 through 3 and advertise that into area 0 and make sure that R2 can reach those loopbacks. Okay, so currently we have, let's hop into R2 real quick and show IPv6 route or SPF. You can see R2 is currently learns all of the specific routes that belongs to R3 loopback 1 through 3. So what we're going to do is 
on router one right here as it advertised into area zero we're going to have r1 summarize that on r3 behalf so on r1 on oh, just to take a quick note on the prefix of the r3 loopbacks we have 2013000102 so to summarize that with the smallest summary route possible these are three contiguous subnet so the smallest one would be slash 62 which includes or incorporated four of those that would be the smallest one which makes our prefix to be let's do it right now ipv6 router ospf1 and here we're going to summarize the route being learned from area one by r1 the command is range and the prefix is going to be 2001 three zero 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 slash 62 okay so that shoot encompasses all three of these loopback subnets and we're just going to give it a cost of one okay so enter now hop back onto r2 do a show ipv6 route ospf we can see these three routes that we saw earlier has now gone and now we are left with a single summary route of 2003 slash 62 and if you're trying to ping some of the loopback from r2 to r3 you see this pingable loopback one loopback two and loopback three okay so that accomplishes our task number five with area summarization